U.S. Infantrymen Rise Up from Cabbage Patch by Graham Miller, Staff Correspondent of the News. With U.S. First Army troops before Shopovin, Germany, December 11th, we are dug in tonight outside Shopovin after being pinched out of pier, which we reached yesterday. We had to get out of pier because there were too many Germans with too many and too heavy guns for us to deal with at the moment. Our infantry attacked pier and took up positions in a factory on the outskirts, knocked loopholes in those walls still standing, and organized bazooka teams and automatic fire to cover all approaches. But they didn't have any tank destroyers with them, and they didn't have much in the way of art artillery support either, because the lay of the land was difficult. Pretty soon, German tanks rolled up and the bazookas opened fire. Some of our men who got back said they were the biggest tanks they had ever seen, the new Tiger Royals. <clears throat> the bazooka shells bounced off their thick hides like dried peas, and the tanks, supported now by self-propelled guns, swung their turrets around in a casual sort of way and proceeded to demolish the factory. Our boars fought as long as they could, until they suffered grievous casualties and the broken-hearted bazooka teams had fired their last ineffectual rounds. Then they got out. Today, from the top floor of a rickety shell-battered building in Inden, which is the 104th division of Major Glenn Terry, Terrible Terry, Allen took after a brilliant attack a week ago. I watched the attack on Chopin. Ahead was open ground, rising to a barely discernible ridge. There were cabbages all across this ground, and beyond the ridge there was Chopin, apparently uninhabited in every detail crystal clear in the warmthless noonday sun. To the right was Pierre, with smoke still rising from it, and still farther to the right lay Merkin. Our infantrymen, lying in foxholes scraped among the cabbages ahead, were waiting for the air corps to blast the town before they jumped off. Lieutenant Ben L. Nicolosi, a black-haired, good-looking young officer who used to spend a lot of time in New York and who spoke with a nostalgia of happy times at Club 18, was talking over a field telephone to batteries back of us. A few seconds later, shells swished over our heads and vivid colored smoke began to drift over Chopin. The shells were markers for the air corps. We all looked at our watches and waited, but the smoke drifted away and the planes didn't show up. Then over another phone came information that the air corps needed more time, but, but would be with us at such and such an hour and could they please have smoke five minutes before that time? It was as casual and informal as receiving a telephone call in a hotel lobby that someone you had arranged to dine with would be a few minutes late. But would you please order two dry martinis? Shaken, not stirred. So we waited and laid the smoke and then the planes came. They were dive bombers and they plummeted out of that blue sky at an awful speed just as if they were eager to demonstrate that they were sorry to have kept us waiting. Our artillery opened up at the same time. Curtained by this fire and destruction, the infantrymen rose from the cabbage patches and began to move forward. But there were winking flashes through the smoke on the other side and enemy shells began to reach out for us. The rickety old building we were in shook and trembled. From the street below our observation window, where a GI had been hit in the leg by a splinter, came a cry for the medics. We clattered noisily down the crazy stairs and sat in the basement. If anybody sneezed, that top floor would fall off. Lieutenant Raymond C. Reagan of 10E Raleigh Avenue, West New Brighton, Staten Island, said. There's nothing we can do up here for a little while anyway, so we might as well be comfortable. And we were, too. <laughs>